First, American Public Media is uh, the largest public radio ownership group in the country. We own stations in five states, and most notably, uh, the biggest public station in Los Angeles, and three networks in the state of Minnesota. Plus, under our American Public Media brand, we produce and distribute national programs to the same stations that are NPR affiliates. Now, NPR is a separate organization in Washington, D.C., and we're very much colleagues and customers and oddly competitors all at once. It's an interesting situation, but they're good folks. And, and we at APM think of ourselves as the nimble sort of entrepreneurial public media company. I'm going to provide a quick overview of APM and our current programs and distribution via public radio, but also via digital audio text and uh, other means as well. Before we get to that, though, I want to give you just a little bit of a better overview of our company. So here we go. American Public Media, producer and distributor of award-winning public radio content designed to engage, inform, and entertain. That's APM, American Public Media. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdahl. Mr. President, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. I mean, it's sustainable on every single level, from businesses, for consumers. What do you suppose life would be like if you'd never gotten hooked on that oh-so-handy electronic tether? This is the Marketplace Morning Report. I'm David Brancaccio. Who knew the Federal Reserve was going to keep buying bonds to stimulate a still damaged economy? You're listening to Marketplace Weekend from APM. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. It's Marketplace Tech for Friday the 20th. I'm Ben Johnson in New York. The world's stories as they happen here on the BBC. Mike Woodridge is our correspondent in Johannesburg. Our correspondent Jennifer Pack joins us now from her balcony in the capital Kuala Lumpur. BBC World Service. It's the splendid table from APM American Public Media. The show for people who love to eat. I'm Lynn Rosetto Casper. I'm Rico Galliano. I'm Brendan Francis Noonan, and from APM American Public Media, this is the Dinner Party Download. And here is the writer's almanac for Monday. Be well, do good work, and keep in touch. Where do you go to get away from it all? This is the composer's datebook for July 1st. Here on Pipe Dreams today from American Public Media. to you live from the fabulous Fitzgerald Theater on Exchange Street in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's a prairie home companion. Get it out on the radio. Sing it loud, baby, say it. That's American Public Media. So thanks for indulging that, but he said it better than I could. So uh, my focus right now, though, is on the future and our strategic plan, which is all about growth, uh, both in reach and relevance, but also in revenue. And we want to do this within these existing channels that we talked about, but also we want to aggressively innovate in securing new channels through partnerships and other business structures. So while we used to talk about vertical integration and owning the means of distribution, now we're talking a lot bigger. We're looking at partnerships to help us get there. And by that, I mean, we're also looking at opportunities outside of nonprofit, as Kim alluded to, like advertising landscapes, events, and even more, like non-media companies that have huge numbers of online connections, say, for example, United Health Group, one of the biggest health insurers in the country. So I'm going to highlight our thinking and efforts today around the marketplace brand, but keep in mind we're going to be thinking about all these brands in terms of how we act. And what I'd like you to, uh, to ask you in the audience to do is think about are there opportunities for us to talk with you about places where those strategic roadmaps might intersect. I think it could be pretty interesting. So let me get back to our portfolio and just walk through that a little bit here. There we go. Um, you can think of our programs, our national programs, that is in basically three areas, news, entertainment, and classical. So we already talked about Marketplace. There's a portfolio of programs there we'll get into. Um, BBC is exclusively distributed by American public media in the United States. And so, as many of you know, BBC might be considered the best or uh, most popular world news brand, and we're really lucky to have that association here in the States. 
Uh, in entertainment, you saw a brief clip of a Prairie Home Companion. That's an interesting property in that it's gone through the change of its founder, Garrison Keeler, um, onto a new talent, Chris Thiele, the mandolin uh, expert. And he's got contacts in um, all kinds of music, especially alt music, alt country, alt rock, et cetera. And so those of you who have been in, in touch with media companies or maybe even worked at media companies that had a founder or in essence an iconic star leave a show know what kind of a challenge that is. We just announced going into year two with Chris Thiele. We've had major pickup in stations across the nation, so that's gonna be a fun brand to follow. Dinner Party Download is in essence the arts and culture section of public radio. It's a one hour weekly show. The Splendid Table is a one hour weekly show uh, about food. It's not a cooking show, but it's about food and certainly has uh, cooking following. Um, and Writer's Almanac you saw as a weekly vignette. Now over on the classical side, you might not think normally about classical music a lot when you think public radio unless you happen to be into it. But APM is the biggest producer of classical music um, in public radio and in fact nationwide uh, in terms of audio for classical music. So it's an interesting portfolio and we've gone more into digital things there as well. For example, on our digital site, yourclassical.org, we have four custom streams, the sleep lullaby stream, the relax stream, the romance stream, the inspire stream. And if you think about classical music and its use in movies, you can envision why those things make sense as a stream. So we're talking to companies like, for example, Mayo Clinic is taking one of our streams and putting it into patient rooms. And what, what is the future of healthcare and health outcomes with regard to music, maybe not just classical music? And I was inspired by our earlier presentations that touched on VR as well, because there's an intersection there, which I think is just really exciting. Um, another thing that we'll talk about in terms of classical uh, is our custom travel portfolio, where we actually take people on trips to see custom classic, classical music venues. So that's an interesting uh, piece from this as well. Now, let me flip over to a PowerPoint. There it is. And that'll get us the rest of the way. Oops, that didn't do it. It did it? Oh, excellent. Okay, then I'm hoping my arrows, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, so what I haven't talked about is our local radio stations and our podcast specific programs. In radio, our LA station, KPCC, is the top public station in the country, the biggest that is, and it's the, uh, the top news station in the country as well, top public radio news station. In Minnesota, we have classical, news and an indie rock network, all three networks. Our indie rock station, The Current, has been cited multiple times as best station nationally in that genre. And upon Prince's death in Minnesota, The Current became the worldwide media focal point for all things Prince for the next week, really. The Current's impromptu street music party outside First Ave, which is the venue where Prince became famous, drew 10,000 people within just hours of his death. Our website delivered 3.3 million page views over the next few days, and our live digital, digital stream of all prints reached 1.6 million listens from more than 200 countries. 60% of all that came from outside of the state of Minnesota. So our local expertise can have big media implications as well. In podcasting, we not only do time shifting of our regular broadcast shows into podcasting, which have become popular like Marketplace, but also specific podcasts that are not heard on air. Brains On, for example, is a podcast for uh, kids around science and their parents. Uh, Dinner Party Download is the one on the right, Splendid Table, those are both time shifted basically. TBTL, Too Beautiful to Live, is a comedy podcast from the West Coast. Historically Black was a partnership with the Washington Post around the African Heritage Museum, which opened up in Washington, D.C. Uh, APM Reports is our documentary unit. And then Marketplace, of course, and Codebreaker, which is underneath the Marketplace umbrella, was a podcast-specific tech podcast. So one other thing I wanted to mention around podcasts was a, a new podcast series that we developed called The Hilarious World of Depression, which 
in and of itself is kind of an odd name, right? But it was celebrity comedians talking about their clinical depression, and actually these episodes are funny. If you have a chance to go find this, it's really good. Um, Paul F. Tompkins, Dick Cavett, Andy Richter, among others, are, are featured on that podcast. And it was sponsored by Health Partners, which is a big HMO. So we're also curious, once again, even in uh, spoken word, about where, uh, where the health field comes into play with regard to audio. <clears throat> now, to the question mark. So you might wonder, why am I here? Well, Kim touched on it a little bit, but I want to outline three reasons that we're talking about why we might think about things outside of public radio. Uh, first, we think we can do better at our mission by doing well. We're nonprofit, we do have a mission, and we want to do well at that. And doing well sometimes means growth. Second, there's pressure on the public media business model. Kim alluded to that, while bigger media companies like ours are only single digit funded by CPB, we're gonna be fine. Uh, what we find is smaller stations that might either be in university settings or other settings that don't have that kind of funding could be really crippled by that. And, and here's where the business model could break down. Those stations pay NPR or APM, depending on the case, to get those programs. If they can't pay that bill, right, then what happens? And third, we've long at APM been entrepreneurs. In fact, we sold a business called Rivertown Trading to Target Inc. for over $100 million back in the late 90s. That became part of our endowment. So we do know about things outside of the nonprofit world, and we're certainly willing to talk and to go there. Now, public radio does have a secret sauce. And it's important to understand that for-profit for media is really trying to understand it too. And here's the notion, how many businesses have a product that you can get for free, but the customers pay to get it anyway, right? So these members, as we call them, are supremely loyal. They give us their credit card numbers, they listen, they download our podcasts, they patronize our advertising sponsors and our underwriters, they buy our t-shirts, our books, our concert tickets and event tickets, and some of them even come on high, high-end curated vacation learning trips. I alluded to this earlier. For example, 150 people touring the Danube and exclusive classical music concerts along the way with Fred Child from our Performance Today program. This spring's trip is to Italy, and here's a shot of the Musikverein in Vienna, which maybe some of you know about. Um, we wonder what partnership opportunities might bring to this initiative. So for example, we just last week had some conversations with New York Times Journeys and we think there may be some possibilities to talk with them about travel as well. So with the pressures on ad revenue due to programmatic advertising, most commercial medias started looking at the member club model too. And of course, that model's rampant across the internet as we heard some of this morning, Stitch Fix, Dollar Shave Club, and others. And so we believe this secret sauce from public media, this loyalty expertise, might be able to be combined with an expertise in networking and reach that we don't have in order to create a partnership that is just simply explosive in terms of potential. And that brings me to a bit of a deeper look at Marketplace. So with Marketplace, we have four main programs underneath the brand. We have the flagship brand in the afternoon. Uh, it's a half hour show that runs every day. Uh, we have Marketplace Morning Report, which is vignettes throughout the morning on these same stations. Marketplace Tech is an eight-minute vignette that runs throughout the week. And Marketplace Weekend, a one-hour show uh, that runs on the weekend, and that one delves a little bit more into personal finance and other areas like that. And what you might not know about Marketplace, though, is it's the biggest business program in radio or television, commercial or non-commercial. Let me say that one more time because it stunned me when I found out. Biggest business program, radio or television, commercial or non-commercial. So on this first slide, you can see our morning audience compared to Fox News, Headline News, CNN, MSNBC, et cetera. That was a stunner to me, and our clients are blown away by it. Our afternoon show, the half hour uh, flagship show, uh, leads amongst Fox News, our own BBC NewsHour, MSNBC, CNN, Headline News, et cetera. So those are the raw facts. But here's the other thing about it. Marketplace is fun. It's got this sort of cachet, this irreverence. We call it business news for the rest of us. So it really wasn't designed for C-suite execs, but a lot of C-suite execs listen, and we can show that actually in a future slide. 
Um, also, it's fun because we delve into other things. What you're seeing here is a podcast that is brand new with uh, Kai Rizdal on the right, who's our host of the afternoon show, show, and Molly Wood, who is our senior tech correspondent. And so they do a podcast called Make Me Smart, which is once a week, roughly 30, 35 minutes, but they can go into more depth on either one or two or three stories and have that be um, really fun and insightful. And so this particular one was called The Singer in the Supercomputer and was about a musician who basically went to bed having hashtagged something and woke up with having it be, had the hashtag be a worldwide trend. So they followed it and tried to figure out, okay, what does that mean for her personal brand and her business? And that's the kind of thing that Marketplace can do. So when you dig into that loyal audience, you discover it is unbelievably desirable. And this is obviously for sponsors and advertisers. Uh, if an index of 100 is the market average nationwide, occupation, top management, index 246, master's degree 268. Influentials, these are people that are active, maybe even running for public office or serving uh, causes or uh, writing articles for newspapers, big index there, 246. High income, 150K plus, 217. And then, oh, this hard to reach thing, not very much television viewing going on. For heavy TV viewing, it's indexing at half the market. So it's an interesting mix of how and where these folks go to get their media. Now, we know how to tap this loyal audience, right? But part of the reason they're so loyal is the news and advertising firewall. Public radio and television has uh, really made that wall formal almost. And w yet we think that there is something that we ought to be looking at in terms of native and native content. That's got potential. And we think there's a chance to trade expertise, bringing our loyal audiences along to trade some expertise with folks who have more um, experience with native and that either might need our production capabilities or tapping into this loyal audience and yet not breaching that firewall. And finally, businesses get it. They understand the audiences we're talking about with Marketplace. And these logos here represent businesses that have sponsored Marketplace. And you can see them in all categories. So business, education, finance, health, et cetera. So that leads me to the question several questions actually of you if i can find my questions <laughs> there they are so firstly where's the head slap for you when you see marketplace and its attributes what do you what do you think when you go why aren't they doing fill in blank that's what i want to know from you there's a broad array of mainline media companies in all places in this room and, and beyond. And so that leads me to the other products we talked about, the other shows in the food category. Tasty has taken off, and so what can we do with Splendid Table? When you think of high-end travel and the club model, how might we fit into your network there? Does the term native content make your head spin, and how might we partner with you on that? Or how might the well-heeled upper demos of our classical mu music audience be interesting in your distribution or your network? So with that, I will pause, and guessing I'm over time or at time. You're almost at time, one, one minute left. Anybody have any questions or thoughts or head slaps? <laughs> Could be head slaps. Uh, yeah. Tim, I'll, I want you to underscore that you are, oh, <clears throat> that you are open to for-profit ventures with uh, for-profit com companies or even your own for-profit ventures. Yeah, sure. We actually have a, a for-profit company that has, uh, it has owned a city magazine or two in the past and has owned other things. So there are ways to get into uh, to that uh, organized effort on the for-profit side, yep. Any other questions? So I, I think that this, this idea that, um, first of all, great numbers. Thanks. Really great numbers, and not surprised, really, that the radio audience might, I don't know if Ryan Familiar is surprised. Are you surprised by that? I did take a picture of the chart. <laughs> Hang on just a second. I always, I mean, I do generally know all the industries, but. Uh, sure. I can, so I'm Ryan Familiar. I'm the news director at KBIA, the public radio station. Oh, here, terrific. So. Nice so, to meet you. I uh, listened to you this morning. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And, and literally, <laughs> literally listened to you this morning. <laughs> So uh, I did have one question, I guess. Thanks, Jim, for putting me out. Um, 
I noticed that some of your uh, podcasts, uh, so like everyone in the world is like, hey, we should start a podcast. Can you help? And it's like, yeah, that's a lot of work if you want to do that. Yeah. Um, how have I noticed there were a few, though, partnerships with some outside organizations yep. on podcasts, Washington Post, things like that. What are some advice or like, more importantly, the trap doors to watch out for on those types yeah. of? That, it's a great question. In fact, our, our digital uh, uh, our digital sales director and I talk about that all the time. Our Minnesota properties and our LA properties are not as successful with podcasts and it's just the tonnage. So don't feel bad. I don't know how to answer that question either from a local station perspective. But I think one of our speakers this morning actually touched on, um, I think maybe from me and Mars, like thinking about who's the audience going to be and why will they care? I mean, that sounds so simple and yet it was so basic and true. Um, so that's what we think about with regard to podcasts as well. We had a, a documentary called In the Dark blow up into a, uh, huge numbers because it basically followed a true crime story in the heart of Minnesota that was never solved. And we thought a lot about who would care, and it wasn't just in Minnesota, so that one actually blew up bigger than the region. All right, Tim Raisley, thank you very thank much. You. Really appreciate it.